Uh, Jennifer, thank you so much for, for that uh, uh, wonderful presentation. Now we're going to open it up for discussion. We're just going to go around. Uh, I think uh, you know everyone who is uh, around this table. They have either chaired or been participated. Uh, Jagan uh, Shah uh, has been working on the Smart Cities Initiative in, uh, in India. Um, uh, 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 Ilaria Boniburini uh, is, comes from uh, the University of um, of Matastat in, in South Africa, I believe, uh, and uh, has been working very closely on uh, many of the UN Habitat 3 agenda items. We're glad to have you. Uh, Sue Parnell was, of course, here in the previous section, a session, and uh, as, uh, you uh, is one of the most uh, respected uh, researchers on the social dynamics in African cities. Uh, so look forward to hearing your comments, and of course, Ricky Burdett needs no introduction. So, uh, um, uh, Jagan, why don't we start with you? We just want to have, what is your reflection uh, on, on, on these presentations? One on the shaping of the city, one on, on, on the smartness of, of land development. I think the fact that we are going to build as many cities in the next 30 years as have been built, one of the statistics we just, uh, I, I've been picking up as we build up to this point, is this is a huge opportunity uh, uh, of, uh, of, of uh, getting it right. Uh, doing it in a way that allows us uh, to deal with the challenges of climate, uh, of globalization, uh, of urbanization in a very smart way. How do we make sure that we don't lose this opportunity and screw it up in the way that uh, Enrico suggested we may have done in the past? Um, thank you, Ivo. Um, <clears throat> I, I want to mention something which actually, strangely enough, hasn't got mentioned uh, enough, I think, um, is the relationship governments have with with their publics, um, and one of one of the um, pillars or cornerstones, uh, whatever you call it, uh, for the smart city mission in in India is what we are calling e-governance. Um, really, removing uh, intermediation by human beings, partly to take care of uh, issues to do with um, corruption, widespread corruption, but also to refashion the relationship between the public and the government and create a certain um, a certain kind of efficiency in that. And I would, I would say that unless we address this problem and we treat government as this sort of thing out there which uh, means everything, uh, means the same thing to everybody, um, I don't think we will achieve this new urban agenda. So uh, re-establishing um, trust between governments and publics, um, to me, is going to be essential um, for the future. Um, I, think, I think we're also living in a time where the trust has been broken down. So reestablishing is, uh, is the question. I, my, one of my reactions, by the way, to the bottom-up, top-down debate was, depends on which bottom is, is, is driving the discussion. If it is the same bottom that is voting in some of our Western countries, I'm not sure I want them uh, to be part of the bottom-up approach. Uh, I'd much rather have them from the top-down approach. But then the question is, how do we get those top-down people from being part of that? So it is, I think it's a critical issue. How do we do this in a democratic way is, is very much part of it. Sue, uh, do you want to take, a, take uh, a stab at, at some of the comments? In fact, when you were both talking, Ricky, I was, I was thinking that when you first coined the urban age, that at least part of what you were doing was trying to provoke that, the, that we were living in a demographic reality of, of more than 50% uh, of people living in cities. But what I was so encouraged by in the discussion um, was, was to hear an African urban leader articulating clearly the African urban dilemma and response to that in an extraordinarily nuanced kind of way means we've come very, very far. And that, that that happens at scale and that there's an African representation to Habitat 3 which says some of those things and is a leading voice in that process, I think reveals an extraordinary amount about leadership. And, and similarly, to have the critique of what kind of city that we are looking for being articulated in an, a very different, very south-south criticism, in a sense, uh, an opportunity and visioning, for me, tells us that we are in a different kind of urban age. We're now, when we are talking about the urban age, we're talking about what's the meaning of the urban in our age. And it's that opportunity of it, to go back to your point about let's not blow it. Um, I'm anxious that we're going to blow it 
for some of the reasons that you alluded to, it is, a, it is likely, it is probable, it is, I hope not certain, that we have institutional capture of Habitat 3 in the way that we perhaps did in the Brexit politics, where the political ambitions of a few or the institutional dynamics of particular entities do not enable the kinds of discussions to play out which would see the implementation of the kind of vision that we have here. And so it does seem to me that we need some real caution as we engage in global poli policy making because the urban community is not used to it. It's not our conventional terrain. We haven't had a global urban policy agenda. So we don't actually know what we're doing and we need to step very carefully. And then just one more point associated with that, which is, is in a sense about this question of, of what do we want and the ambiguity of it. And for me, it's summed up in what I think is the false consciousness of the discussion. And you probably have some interesting things to say about this, about the discussion about the right to the city. So, so for those of you who are not involved in this habitat discussion, basically there are two hot issues. One is what's the role of habitat, UN habitat, which is what I've just been alluding to. And the second is this question of should we have a right to the city? And my concern with that is that it's going to polarize us and those who don't want it and those who do want it are equally ambiguous about what they want. So the right to the city is ill-defined and if you got it, you wouldn't know what you were getting and if you didn't get it, you wouldn't know what you were missing. And that is an indictment on the urban academic and intellectual leadership unlike some of the other proposals which were being put on the table earlier, which I think were quite specific, were quite structural in, in their understanding, and which I think resonate with real experiences, particularly those of local government. And so the politics of local government would be the one thing that I would really put on the table back as a, what do we have to make sure we don't lose? Ilaria, pick up on that, on, on the point particularly. It'll come on by itself. It's magical. Okay. Yes, the right to the city was uh, heavily discussed, especially was a controversial issues when we arrived in New York and uh, at this PREPCOM meeting. And uh, some countries oppose the idea of, of the right to the city. Okay. The right to the city has been around for many years, it started to be around with the Henri Lefebvre in the 60s, uh, 1960, and it very much connected to a specific period of uh, fight, of uh, both the labor and student uh, fight to, um, to have access to the city, to have access to public services, to have access to kindergartens, and also to participate to uh, the politics of the city, so that citizens would have a, a say in what is going on. So I think that these principles are still very valid today, and this is what the right to the city may bring. The fact that everybody should have access to space, not to just the urban, because also this was another discussion that was going on in some of, uh, of the policy paper, whether urban is, is defining formally a certain space or whether urban is a way of going spatially on certain phenomena, which is we, what we should really do. And the third element that the right to the city brings, even since Lefebvre, is, is diversity and difference, because I think this is the crucially most important issue, and this is where I think with this habitat tree we are losing. Meaning that um, what, is, what is an agenda, no? Uh, an agenda is, uh, it cannot be a series of recommendations. I mean, how many countries, how many cities we have, we cannot give a recipe for everybody. So an agenda is maybe a vision, maybe it's a set of principles. And that is what the right to the city does, perhaps. A set of principles, not a recipe and not a policy. Otherwise, we reduce the diversity of this entire world on similarity. And we have seen through those two days what's happened if we follow the same model. So, 
And I think this is what we are losing because I think there is the temptation of giving a series of recommendations instead of open up, opening up for letting possibility to take place. And I think it's because we are scared. I think that, um, who said um, uh, before, you know, um, I think Hank, Hank, Hank said, no innovation if uh, we trust the policy of today. You need to change the rules. But I think that the rules are staying the same. And that is where I think, uh, and we are stuck. I mean, you, you, um, Eric, you gave a fantastic summary of all the most uh, important uh, principle, impost, uh, fundamental principle of, our, of, of urban planning. But if we go back to the urban planning books, those principles have been there, but then Jose Castillo showed us as, you know, how many failure even if those principles have been there for so many years. So, and the world is changing so much. So I think we should allow the, for all this diversity and possibility to, to come in and just uh, impede to, to impose one model, one grid. I mean, the grid is power. And it's one specific power that comes from a specific part of the world. Come in on, on, on this point because I think you're, you, you, you see it, said it as strongly as one possibly can, but the power of national government to drive the collective action that is necessary in order to make the right decisions to overcome municipal and, and, and private interests was, was central to your argument. How is that going to be reflected in, uh, in the discussion at, uh, in Quito? Because the right of the city is conflicting in some ways with the right of the national government. How do we get that right? I believe that, of course, Habitat will not oblige anybody, will not uh, force anybody to do anything. Or, I mean, yes. <laughs> but it can have, if it is not too vague, if it is not too ethereal, I prefer that Habitat runs the risk of disrespecting uh, local uh, idiosyncrasies or whatever, than to run the risk of being irrelevant. So, once this can be useful for many people who will, of course, many of these things were proposed from even from the 76 habitat. So, uh, I don't care if it's national government or if it's uh, some regional government, but what it's clear is first that we should know what we would want. And second, we need the tools to achieve this. And clearly what I say, private property does not work in the case of land around growing cities. Why? Because the market works that when the prices go up, supply increases and then prices go back down. This is what happens with tomatoes. But in the case of land around growing cities, you can increase the price all you want and the supply of land that is accessible to uh, transport to education to jobs does not increase. So clearly the market does not work there. So there must be some kind of intervention. And it cannot be private. And I, I think municipal governments, local municipal governments with different agendas. For example, for a municipal government next to a large city, it may be very wise, for example, it happens in Bogota, to have high income uh, gated communities because they pay a lot of taxes, they don't use the health uh, system, they don't use the education system, they don't even need sewage system because they have their own. So, but in the regional perspective, it's completely wrong. So, I, I do believe that we need some kind of, not necessarily national, but we need some kind of state authority that will be able to uh, uh, really use land to do the right place. In Bogota, just to one in two seconds I, I finish this, we have everything is wrong. Half the city grew up illegally because of private property of land. It grew in the wrong places, without enough roads, without enough parks, without places for schools, everything, and this is what I see that is happening everywhere. I'm intrigued in a way by you know, after two days, the conversation we're having now, because if I hear your two presentations, you're in, you run cities. What you talk about is incredibly spatial. 
I mean, Enrique, you're a sort of spatial nutcase. I mean, you're someone who, where everything about the city comes around getting the infrastructure right, and that's not just roads and cycleways, but everything else that comes in, the, the, the physical location of schools, uh, and that somehow is a prerequisite of a form of, of equity that, in, in your mind. Jennifer, you also, in the end, if you look at your slides, and even when you talk about waste, when you talk about education, these are all very physical things, in effect. They, they require someone making a decision about where something goes, let alone uh, how, who pays for it, but where it goes. And if I hear your three comments, they're actually very unspatial. So, you know, your discussion, Larry, about uh, the rights of the city is... Uh, uh, okay. Not really. Mm -hmm. Jagan's point about relationship to central government, yes, it's institutional, etc. So, my reaction to influencing uh, Jean Claus and colleagues is what can we do in terms of actually the language of this document, right, which will come out, which doesn't force these worlds and keep them apart. Why do I say that? Because the tendency will be always, and of course Ron Cross knows this perfectly well, that uh, only road people will read the transport chapter. Uh, only, you know, civic engagement people will read the chapter on rights of the city. And in a way you duplicate the silos that exist out there in the professions and everything else. And the great risk then, I think, and I'm interested to hear from you, is that you get technical solutions just technical solutions to actually fundamentally non-technical, social, cultural, ethical questions. And I, I would push this document to actually start a slightly different language. I've seen some of you know, the zero draft which is out there, uh, and I'm not sure we've, we've, we've done very much. No, it's not up to us. But perhaps uh, you know, as a, as a sideline partner of, of um, Habitat 3 and the discussions we have with Jean Cross and, uh, and his colleagues, maybe actually doing something about that language so you mix up these, these discussions that, you know, you've just said, well, I mean rights to the city of spatial. If I were to play devil's advocate, I'd say, actually, I haven't heard that. Well, what does that actually mean? Jean-Louis Missica was very, very clear that for him in Paris and for Hidalgo, there are certain very, very spatial things uh, which will ensure a degree of equity that at the moment the city doesn't have. So I'm not being critical of you, I'm just saying that I think there's a tendency to inhabit our own linguistic spaces, and I'm not, I'm not being generic here, I'm sorry, because this then turn, gets turned into policy. No. I'm just going to jump in there, actually, because um, although I am an interloper, I do do my homework, and so I have read the, the, urban, the zero draft of Urban 3, and the thing that struck me, having read an awful lot of documents around international regulation at different levels, etc., is that it just paints a utopia. What you have in that document is, is a pile of conflict and contestation. Uh, and we can hear that already around the table. Contestation between the market, between government. Contestation between rights. Contestation, the, the notion that the bottom is a homogenous whole that's going to see the same way. And we know that in other spaces that we have in our society, the way we want to govern ourselves, we have to allow an appropriate balance between disparate variety contestation whilst enabling some kind of central actor to resolve collective action problems, coordination problems. So my response looking at the document of, urban, of, of the zero draft is, you know, it sounds great, it solves nothing. Um, but that's my slightly pessimistic look um, on the outside. Jennifer, I don't know if you want to, to come in on this, is how you've managed to, to gain the success that you have, and because you did talk about urban age three, urban three is providing some solutions here, and I was just wondering where you saw hope. I think one of the uh, facts that we have to accept is that, yes, we can have the documents signed at the end of these big meetings, but what really matters is the implementation in the different um, countries, and in this case, the say the urban, urban centers. And sometimes I wonder whether it would be more practical to have different treatments of different problems at different levels. Because what one country may be able to do, 
another country may not be able to do because of the special um, circumstances of these different countries. And perhaps have a more, therefore, focused look at what is actually being done as follow-up activities, depending on the different gradings of the different countries. I don't know, because practically speaking, if you look at these big documents and look at all the text and all the solutions, it looks like utopia, as you say, and it doesn't quite address my specific challenges. My specific challenges, for example, with land, the land holding. Uh, how do I get around it in order to go to the next step of actually planning? Private land in the cities doesn't work for development and expansion. But yes, but I have private land in the city. So what do I do to get to a level where I can actually implement some of these um, solutions that are being given? Can it start by addressing these peculiar problems perhaps and coming up with solutions or suggestions for them and then building on that to get um, solutions that work? To speak upon the question of language um, and use some of the language of the conference um, and to try and relate it back to where it does and where it doesn't appear um, in, in the new urban agenda and specifically to the language of space um, in, in the way that we, we've, we've spoken about. And it, it seems to me that the, the, the first difficulty of inserting space the new urban agenda is relatively strong on institutions. It's not as strong on space. And part of the reason for that is, is that it uses scale in three different ways. It talks about the city and how the city has to change. It talks about the city system, territorial development, yeah, which is a national, typically national, could be regional concept. And it talks about the urban planet. In other words, how all cities together. And how you intervene in space in those different scales is very, very different. And I think our discussion today was really interesting when we talked about the bottom-up and the big projects and how that, that scale a question. And I think that trying to kind of capture that and help people to be clearer about that would be really good. Um, d just quickly on that. I mean, I think the difficulty for this community here is that... Um, Actually, design is a language that needs institutions. And the, so, so Ricky's kind of, I don't know if you can see him on the, on the screen, he can't, he's got a little quizzical thing on his nose. And sort of, what do you mean? And, and what I mean by that is, is that to change space, in the way that Jennifer was talking about, the document is very clear that you need to change financial systems. It is also very clear that you have to change planning. What it doesn't do is it doesn't talk about design. And I think one of the reasons for that is because the notion of design, the language of design, is a very Western concept, it's a very elite concept, and as insofar as it has been articulated in an urban concept, it doesn't have traction in Africa and large parts of, of, of Asia, certainly. So I think that's some of why we've got a dissonance, and we have to find ways to rectify that, otherwise we're going to leave it out, and that is going to be a problem. Um, I think that there are two articulations of, of something which is very fundamental, which, uh, which needs to be really on the table at Habitat 3. Um, what Joan Kloss keeps saying about the fact that the city is a means to an end. Um, Ed Glazer put it very well. There's no pathway from poverty to uh, prosperity which doesn't pass through city streets. I, I love that articulation of it. But uh, can, we, can we recognize the fact that cities are pathways in some sense and not destinations anymore? We spent about 100 years making cities which are destinations. Um, and I mean destinations in, 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 in a sort of a fixed sense, that uh, your options close once you reach the city. Um, but what is astounding to me is that we're not able to arrive on uh, at uh, some key sort of non-negotiables. Um, it's interesting, uh, and we experience this in India a lot, uh, SDG goal 11 is the urban goal, but SDG 1 is remove poverty in all its forms, and goal 11 surely is about 1, um, but we don't address 1, and why can't we do that? Why, why can't we simply say that removing poverty in the 21st century has got to be an achievable goal for the international community, which is debating Habitat, at Habitat 3. Um, why can't we provide housing for everybody? Um, 
if you do the math, it is not uh, prohibitively expensive to do so. Uh, but we don't. Um, why can't we recognize that everything that governments need to do, most governments will admit that they can't do themselves. So they need the private sector. So public-private partnership is clearly uh, a necessary part of or ingredient of this new recipe. Um, and what we also discussed in, in the uh, uh, <clears throat> discussion earlier today, participation. I mean, clearly the citizens do know about some things better than governments do. Uh, their lived experience, their daily life, um, the minutiae of life, and maybe the design or planning of that needs to be more participative, and why can't we just agree upon that? And this is the baffling part of this international discourse. Um, I just wanted to put that on the table. Yeah. I'm both an architect and uh, an urban policy you know, expert. So. The issues of language is the, is definitely a problem, and I agree with both of you. But there is an element which is not conciliable, and that design is is about it, you don't design abstract, you don't design without a specific content in mind. Otherwise, you get it wrong. So how you can come up with a spatial recipe that fit the entire world when the principle of design is that the first rule is to get really your context right and known up to the point, I mean, to the detail, which is the, the, the architect that design without going on site. I mean, if one of my students comes and get, give me a design and is not being on site, it's, it just gets it wrong. So those two elements are not conciliable. So what shall we do with this urban agenda? I don't think that this urban agenda is utopian. I wish I was utopian. At least it was an utopia for the future because one of the elements that we have been discussing today is that inequity. Does really this urban agenda address the issue of equity, of a spatial justice? No, because there are discussions about even putting the right to the city. The right to the city doesn't have a special prescription. And I hope that it doesn't have a special prescription. Okay? But has a special but has a special impact. And Okay. Um, this is my view that is not especially prescriptive and it shouldn't be. But the, the, when I say the right to the city and you have the right to access and the right to occupy space, one translation, one special translation is that we should stop eviction. We should stop expulsion. This is one of the biggest problems in our world and this urban agenda doesn't say it specifically. It doesn't do, not because we are not capable of thinking it. It doesn't really explicitly say we should stop all eviction, we should stop expulsion. Why? Because not all countries agree on it. This is, I mean, we have to be very clear about, uh, about this and even about embracing differences. We have to be clear that, yes, we say it in theory, but then there is often the same model of development on the table. There are even the same type of lines through across all the projects that we have seen. Even today we talk about the grid. The grid is a model how we can get over it if we don't really think differently. And I think it's very difficult to do it. Enrique, did you want to come in or, or um, no, Rick? I, I do believe that the right to the city is totally special. I don't know if I understand the issue, but uh, clearly you need to find a place for the poor to live in a good place with great design. With, with, I mean, you may change the design, but you clearly need, you know, parks. You need big pedestrian spaces. You need a priority to public transport. I mean, I think almost design begins, design of the space begins with this principle, which seems very simple. This is why I mentioned, if all citizens are equal, then a road space, which is the most 
crucial space in a city has to be distributed democratically. It means a, a pedestrian, somebody who walks, has the right to the same amount of road space as somebody in a Rolls Royce. Or this is what justifies having a, if a bus with 100 passengers has a right to 100 times more road space than a car with one. Or a, and, and I believe, for example, again I come back to the, if the, the most obvious space is land. For example, if, as, let's assume government owned the land around growing cities for a second. Actually, when, in, a, in, it, in, it, in, in the sixties, we did a lot of rural land reform. The governments would come and buy the big farms, they take, use eminent domain, take the farms away from the big landowners and make little plots for the uh, smaller owners. But I think urban land reform is much more important than rural land reform because that's where people will live. So if government were, we created an institution, since we talk about the institution, in our, when I was mayor last time, we, which would buy voluntarily or forcibly land around the city at rural prices, rural land, and then the, the value increased through changing use and urbanization would be accrued to, to government, not to some private developer. In most developing countries, the, rich, the, the people who become richest, especially in incomes around $2,000 or $1,000, is through land speculation. So if government owns the land, you can do an amazing city, regardless of, of anything else, because I mean, you can discuss of how the, the park is done, or how the sidewalk is done, or how the building is done, but you will have a city that is in the right location, with space for schools, with great sidewalks, with uh, good public transport, but the whole issue is land. On the other hand, if you do not have the land, it's a total mess. The city grows in the wrong places, uh, it's extremely costly, environmentally a mess, there is not enough roads. For example, on one last thing, why, why is the physical so important? Because other things can be solved later. Let's assume somebody does not do enough nursery, nurseries. Of course we should do them, but let's assume they can do them later. But if they don't save land for a park, 10 hectares for a park, it's impossible 50 years later to demolish 10 hectares of a city to create the park. So, one of the things that makes different the physical in cities that are being created is that almost all of the problems can be solved later. You can do the hospitals later, the nurseries later. You shouldn't. I'm, I'm not advocating that they should be done later. But if the city is not planned from the start, well, it's almost impossible to correct it afterwards. One issue is, is um, the, the new build, and the other issue is how you retrofit what is there. Ilari, I think we have, there's a genuine, there's not a misunderstanding, there's what is design question, which, you know, same, not dislike, what, is, what, what the rights for whom and, and all that. But um, when, when I think, and I think Enrique has just said it and Jennifer implies it in her description, that uh, the rights of the city has a spatial dimension is very different from saying um, design a piece of city and you've got to do that with a context. We've heard for the last two days, and this is where I will defend every single architect who's come here, they wouldn't be in this room, they wouldn't be in this binale, if there weren't a recognition that there's a relationship between those two, which 95% of my profession, architects, your half profession, so to speak, actually doesn't recognize and couldn't give a damn about. And, and, and unfortunately, that's, that's the, the real sort of world. I think what we heard in these days uh, was very much a more sophisticated way of trying to deal with adaptability, incompleteness, openness, right? Mm -hmm. And I think that's, that is the new language which I don't see and don't hear mm -hmm. in that document. That would be a bloody good idea and it would help both of us, mm -hmm. uh, I think, if we, if, if we actually had that. So in that sense, I don't think we should revert back into positions where there's, you know, they're the socially minded architects and, 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 there's, and, and the rest, because I think that's, that's actually unhelpful. Let me, let me just give one example from our city, Julia, which uh, uh, we know. We, we, in, in terms of how do you deal with, with, with these issues uh, of social in, inequality in a spatial way, London has a profound east-west division in terms of life chances. Basically, eight years difference, seven years difference from West London to East London. Every city, your cities, Paris, we heard even more dramatically, 11 years difference from one side of the street to another. 
We have used, we Londoners, partly through the mayoral and the power of the mayor, and Andy Altman was here before, through his running of the Olympics project and Tessa Jow, we've used that spatial investment to try and literally rebalance life chances between East and West London. The result of five years' investment of better transport, better public space, better schools, etc., etc., has meant that some of these social parameters have changed already pretty dramatically. If there wasn't a spatial vision to this, you wouldn't have solved that problem. That's what I'm talking about. I guess I shouldn't call it design. I should talk about You're the, the physicality. Uh, specifically of one city. You're talking... Yes, but exactly, you're talking about one city. You're not making a recipe for all the city. This is the contradiction. I'm not, I agree with you what I think is not uh, advisable even is to give special uh, indication at universal level because special characteristics are connected to a very specific social, economic, and political condition. Because every line, and you know, every line that you draw on a territory is also an expression of power, is not neutral. So, exactly, but how you can draw in abstract thinking that this drawing is gonna fit Kampala uh, and is gonna fit London? We're going to, um, I'm going to open it up to the floor now. We've had, you've been very patient listening to the debate that's going on here. Um, but I think it's quite clear, as ever, how you deal with different levels, different levels of governance, the achievement, the, the expression of universal goals, which we know then have to be locally implemented, which have to suit particular local contexts. And we may not always be in a position um, that we want to be. The, the classic, you know, well, I wouldn't start from here uh, when you ask for directions. So we know we have those different contests, and we know we've, got, we've been talking about the relationship between spa, uh, scale and space, and the different agents and modalities of intervention which might be necessary um, at different levels of scale and space. So now I just want to open it up to the floor for reflections on how we manage these, these different contrasts between different levels, between different contestations that we have, and the relative role of, different, of the state and of the, of the many, many locals um, in resolving these Quite wicked problems. I think we have some roving mics wandering around. So if you just put up your hand and wave, because the lights are right in my eyes. So there's a lady right, right in the front uh, with the glasses. Sorry. Oh, no, no. She was, she was first. Sorry. Out of shot. Okay. Hello. Yes. Listening. Uh, so Anna Claudia Husba, Cities Alliance. Uh, I just want want to make a quick reflection about uh, the notes from uh, the mayor Penalosa and uh, Ilaria's uh, comments. Uh, just for reflection, uh, he mentioned that uh, we in Latin America made several mistakes. So we had a mix of top-down policies, of non-democratic decisions, of the absence of the right to the city for several years. So people would come to our cities and uh, they wouldn't have houses, they wouldn't have access uh, to jobs, they wouldn't have access to opportunities, no? So it was the complete absence of the right to the city. We did everything wrong. So we ended up with crowded cities, overcrowded cities, very unequal cities, very segregated cities, very polluted cities and very violent cities. We are paying a very high price for not providing for many, many years, at least 20 to 25 years during the period of our urbanization, uh, the right to the city. Uh, it's ironically that the Latin American countries are coming together around this concept so strongly. So at the regional conference in Toluca, the right to the city was on the top of the agenda. I just came from the meeting in Asuncion where the housing and urban ministries from Latin America met. They came out with the declaration of Asuncion where the central point is the right to the city. So I'm just showing up to you for reflection. Why this continent that made so many things wrong is claiming all together for the right to the city? Please think about it. Thank you.
Thank you. So I think I'll take another couple of comments and then come back to the panel. Lady in the middle there. Hi. Uh, my name is Nina Ilieva and I'm an architect and urban planner. First, I want to thank everybody for the discussion and for the great conference. Uh, I would like to make some suggestions and questions. Uh, my first suggestion uh, is uh, uh, maybe when we are talking about bottom-up and top-down approaches, um, we have to think about uh, refugees and uh, people who also, and immigrants who also can join the table. Because we are talking about top-down top and bottom-up. Is there any immigrants or refugees here? Is there any immigrants or refugees here? No? Okay. I'm not, yes. But I'm talking about the one who is living in these neighborhoods. Uh, so we don't have. So I would have my story. I'm an immigrant. I haven't been living in the exact um, neighborhoods you are showing. Uh, I was lucky enough not to live in these kind of neighborhoods. But I've been living as an immigrant both in Europe and in the United States. And I'm ra happy right now to have um, both European and uh, American citizenship. So um, I want to tell you something about uh, my experience. Uh, I'm originally from Bulgaria. When I, went to, uh, when I was an immigrant in Europe, it was a long time ago. <coughs> I'm sorry, I'm a little bit nervous. <laughs> but. Um, when I went there, and I was in Austria, the people were asking me where you are going back home. And they're asking me if I'm not a refugee. So I just accepted that's very normal. Then my family immigrated to the States. I went to the States and I accepted, I was expecting the same, um, the same attitude. But when I went to the States, the people were telling welcome. So I was really surprised from, from these attitudes from the United States. And I'm happy right now to say that I'm American and Bulgarian. So I think we have to catch up, Europeans, we have to catch up. Yes, we join European Union, we are happy, but we have to catch up with the diversity and with the openness which United States have. That's from the point of immigrants. That's from my personal experience. My second, oh, I just have only one more suggestion and I'm finishing. My second thing, when I went back to Bulgaria, I decided that I have to do something because if you want to change, you want to make a change in the world, you have to be the change you want, you, you want to see in the world. So I, I went back and I saw that we are really very much uh, ethnic. We, were, we have a really very bad prejudice against Romani people, and we had in Bulgaria. So I started working on that. But I haven't seen anybody touching this really bad topic in Europe. There are more than 11 million uh, Romani gypsies people living in really p poor neighborhoods in Europe, even in Rome, everywhere. Nobody is talking about that. So I'm just like, um, I talked to Juan. San Carlos, and maybe we can talk to the director of the Venice Biennale about that, why we haven't raised this issue and this topic. But um, I would be really happy if you're trying to get us to do something and to make the, better, the world a better place. Thank you. Okay, I've got a couple of questions. If I could just ask, ask people to be quite brief and to actually ask, pose a question, that would be most helpful. Thank you. So to write, um, so I'm, I'm looking at a, a lady in a white shirt and a lady in a red, in a blue jacket, at the top, Further top of the up. stairs, top of the stairs. Uh, okay, well, you'll come next. Uh, following and engaging in this urban discourse for more than 30 years now, I think it is necessary to, to come back from time to time to the physical. And I see this um, reluctance in the academic world and in, the, um, in urban politics to talk about physical solutions. And the reason why um, people like Jaime Lerner and uh, Enrique Penalosa are so influential and uh, they are guiding the way is because they produce physical um, examples, models. And in the end, we will have to solve uh, problems on the ground with typological structural proposals. And I think um, Habitat 3 should also be an occasion to talk about physical models which can guide people, inspire people all, all over the world and draw their own uh, conclusion and deduct their own local solutions from it. 
question there about the role of uh, technical, structural and physical models. So just the two questions at the top there, and then uh, I'll come back to the panel, and then I am going to take some questions from this bank here in the next round. Thank you. Rebecca Chuto from Make Architects in London. Um, I'd be quite interested to hear from Enrique Peña Rosa here. I was wondering what your take was on informality or what's been termed as the hustle economy of slums, because I don't think it's really been mentioned much today. Um, and I've read quite a lot about it, and I think people need it. And uh, it seems quite a lot from the discussions that it seems uh, people, it's been quite dismissed. So I'd be quite interested to hear your views. Middle. Um, I'm Jane Damosto, I live here in Venice, and it's kind of a message from a shrinking city to all these growing cities that are represented in the room. And I've heard a lot of talking about spaces and institutions and ownership, and I've got the impression that public ownership is a kind of panacea. But what I want to emphasize, speaking from my own personal example, um, personal experience of living here and seeing what's going on is that critical to public ownership is participation. You can't have one without the other. And here we are in the Arsenale, which represents almost a fifth of the city, including the water, which for Venice is a very important part of our city. A third of it is occupied by the Navy. A third of it is the Biennale. Here we are here in these spaces that are used for about six months of each year for display-based you know, cultural production. The Venice Municipality also owns this and owns the, all that huge area on the other side of the water from where we are here. And almost nothing is happening there. And, um, it's a great pity, and if anybody has anything to add to help us improve our techniques of engagement and participation to make sure that the city can grow there, because it's a very important part of the city since everywhere else is squeezed and suffocated by mass tourism. So thank you. So we've got a range of questions there in relation to the role of technology in structural physical models, the issues about participation, obviously come up the particular issues on slums and the issue of public, public private ownership. Enrique, you had a specific question to you. Do you want to address that? And then I'll throw it open to the rest of the panel. Hello? Okay. Well, slums prove, as Slomo Angel said here, that if people have access to the land, they can solve their housing problem. So the land, again, is the issue. The problem is that often they are in the wrong places, and again, because government does not own the land but some illegal developer, so there is not enough space for roads, for sidewalks, for parks. But I, I think slums have wonderful characteristics. I think many slums are better than what the architects do, with all respect. Uh, and then urbanists do formal architects. Uh, we have architects are in their conservation boards in cities and they want to preserve everything. You know, we have more preserved preserve houses in Bogota than in Paris, perhaps. Because their fathers or their grandfathers or their university professors were the ones who designed that. And they think this house should be conserved, preserved, not for 30 years, not for 300, not for 3,000, not for 30,000, but forever as a treasure of to monument to their greatness and genius. I believe that we should preserve some slums because they are really not really slums. They are very creative. I love in Bogota at least, uh, as they have been very free to develop, actually they leave enough road space uh, to move. I mean, not enough, but uh, they leave road space. They have terraces. They keep plants in the terrace. And so they come in the mountains, and they're in the mountains, the wrong place to be, but they have a beautiful view. They can talk to the neighbor in the house across the street from their own window. 
So I, I think they have wonderful characteristics, and what we have done is to legalize them, to improve them, to provide them fantastic schools, best, better school facilities than, in the, than the best private schools for the upper income people, some fantastic libraries. Here I am very happy they mentioned the Medellin libraries several times. We did some better ones before those <laughs> in the slums. So and that this is what has to be done. Uh, infrastructure to improve the slums. Libraries such as the ones in Medellin, parks, uh, public transport, and legalize them. And I think we can learn a lot from, from slums. Any question that came up just we would I like to respond to? I to mention um, the slums. And um, hearing what uh, Enrico says about slums in Bogota, I think I would have a very different position on the slums that we have in Africa. And um, so the challenge is always how do we treat the slums, particularly sitting on problems of land ownership. And one of the reasons the slums develop, say, in Uganda is because the land is privately held and the owners allow these people to build as they want. And you cannot, as government, just evict them without adequate compensation. But they are uh, a big problem, the sanitation, the facilities. They do not build leaving enough space for roads or any form of infrastructure. So um, I think they are the worst form of slums that you could have, and uh, preserving them would just be preserving a problem. So we have to deal, find ways of dealing with them and redeveloping them to provide decent housing for, for our people, um, unlike perhaps what the other jurisdictions have to do. 30 second comments. Mm -hmm. 30 second last comments on slums. First, since we have slums in every developing country city in the planet, including there were slums in London or Paris at a time, it's clearly not because governments are stupid or corrupt, because it's impossible that every mayor in the world is stupid or corrupt. It's because the system doesn't work. The private property of land does not work. And so, and second, in, in, uh, in some countries, the slums are better, such as in Bogota, and these cities or the ones we saw in Mexico, because they have been tolerated. So basically, they are almost legal. So they can afford to leave streets and all of this. If they are repressed by government, they tend to make a, a whole mess where there is no public space at all or anything. Thank you. So I need to take some more questions, and I know we need to finish, certainly by six. So I've got two more questions over here. So gentleman in the back row with the glasses. Thank you. And then gentleman there with the, the beard on the end. And then, OK, a really quick one from, from you right next to him. OK, one minute. I haven't missed anybody. Okay, again, just remember, if you could be quite brief and pose a question. Near the mics, we don't hear. Okay, if you could be quite brief yes. when your question. Yes, uh, my name is Alexander Stolle. I'm from School of Architecture in Stockholm. Uh, we have a wonderful paradox here. We're in car-free Venice, talking about uh, how the last century of the auto centric urban development and all of the things that has been shaped in terms of social segregation and land consumption of this uh, development. Uh, my question uh, is um, how do you think that the uh, new technologies of uh, self-driving cars will shape the future of uh, future cities and uh, urbanism because that's kind of a bottom-up top-down problem. Uh, I'm uh, a bit surprised that the, of, of, that the discussion today has not referred sufficiently to resource depletion and climate change. Alejandro did refer to this as a major challenge if we succeed in our material objectives, but I I'm surprised that in this discussion, we seem to not really connecting to the huge body of science in the world that I circulate in that really does suggest that the kind of optimistic modernity that Ed Glazer was talking about is just simply not going to happen. It's, 
it's bad economics to assume that this reality does not exist. So it is an opportunity for redefining what is possible. And so when we talk globally about urban expansion and we see a picture of empty land, there's food growing there. One of the biggest uh, fundamental paradoxes in the world today is the necessity for additional land and the fact that food growth is now dropped for the first time below population growth. And we have a major, major long-term clash between the resources required for food production and the resources required for urban expansion. We can't just ignore that. Uh, if you look at the African context, the installed electrical generation capacity in Africa is equal to what exists in France. If Africa energizes using fossil fuels, none of the Paris agreements will be reached. So you have to completely redefine what energy means in the African context if you want 800 million people to be living in cities who are not dependent on fossil fuels. It's just a brutal, factual reality. It means reinventing grids, energy, urban efficiency, buildings, densities. Everything follows from that. Okay, and it's an opportunity. It's not, I don't believe in the world of constraints and sustainability. I believe in the world of opportunity that it creates, but we have to invoke it. Otherwise, we just, it's bad economics. Uh, hi, I have a quick question. I'm an architect and um, practice as an urbanist uh, in Asia, um, which didn't come out so much in the discussion yet, I feel. Um, and I work on projects of, for example, 30 square kilometers in uh, Vietnam. Our client is a developer. Uh, their clients are, of course, uh, new homeowners, or so they hope. Those homeowners want to have uh, a house with a lawn, so they want low-density uh, housing. Um, my question is, who takes the responsibility? We cannot take the responsibility because we are paid eventually by the developer. Of course, we do our best to propose uh, the best city we can, but we, you know, we are in a, in a certain position. Um, the new people who are going to live in those houses with their lawns are not going to take the responsibility. The developer definitely is not going to take the responsibility. The government in Vietnam is building the roads um, and maybe should take the responsibility, but they don't. So who is going to take the responsibility? for the city. Okay, thank you. So three excellent, very different questions there. I'm going to open it up to the panel and ask you just to pick on any one of those that you, would, you want to hit on. I'd like to, to reply to one that seemed to be referring to me. <laughs> uh, first, we cannot have this emotional view that cities cannot grow. Uh, Bogota, for example, as I mentioned, has one of the highest densities in the planet. Bogota has four times more inhabitants per hectare than London, has three times more inhabitants per hectare than Sao Paulo, and we have now 2.6 million homes, and we need to build 2.7 million more homes over the next uh, 40 years. In Asia and Africa, the growth is going to be much more. So clearly, we cannot fit all the growth of cities inside the existing cities. Of course, if some of this can be done, wonderful, but cities need to grow. But we need to grow precisely so as to have compact cities that move by public transport. So I do think that we address the global warming issue because precisely to have, I think, all through the two days, global warming has been addressed because the best way to counteract global warming is to have compact cities that move by public transport and by bicycle. And the way to achieve that is to plan those cities and to intervene and not to allow just the free market to spread out in low-density, uh, car-dependent, gated communities. Mark, this is, Mark, this is slightly odd because I'm talking to you and you're behind me. <laughs> but um, perhaps I was um, indirect and let me be overt um, in the comments that I was making which I think are address your concern about resource constraints and about what it means to live on an urban planet and what that means in the Habitat 3 agenda as it is currently articulated and the concern for me is that what the new urban agenda does at the moment 
is that it tries to spell out how to make cities work better. I think that's a good thing. I think it's actually quite a radical agenda that's in there. It may not be complete, it may lack a language of design, it may not be sufficiently spatial, but it really does get to some of the concerns which have been on the table. And that's a prerequisite for doing the much bigger transformative change. What I also alluded to, though, was that I think we are being hijacked by institutional politics within the UN. And that relates exactly to the question that you are talking about. And it relates to the question of whether UN Habitat is in a position to take on the climate agenda, to take on the Sendai Risk agenda, to take on your question about refugees and migration, the humanitarian agenda, all of which have urban dimensions. And you, you were talking about how every SDG has an urban application. And so it does seem to me that what we need to be careful of is that we don't overburden this agenda and this expectation of what Habitat 3 can achieve. However, what we absolutely need to do is to leave an escape clause, a mechanism, to ensure that we are able to pick up the complexity of the urban issues which relate to living on an urban planet in a sustainable way, which I do not will think will be resolved by the time we get to, out of Quito. I think just to take a, a couple of points about, um, I think there is a connection between what Mark is talking about and the way Mark, a lot of this was articulated very well yesterday uh, and perhaps we need to be more open about it. But everything certainly I've read and heard from my colleagues, Philip Rowe is very involved in one of the policy units for the New Urban Agenda. There certainly is much more of an awareness of the environmental issue as linked to many of the other issues, including the spatial, than uh, certainly might have been 10 years ago. I think w one of the critical things is how do you keep people in cities in a livable way, in an equitable way, and retrofitting what is there and improving what is there is just as important as planning new. And I think that is a critical thing to remember. And I think um, the more this document can focus on that. And to take the point about the slums, I think maybe we haven't used that word that much openly. I think there's an embarrassment sometimes to use that word because it, it sounds so derogatory. But certainly a lot of people in the room have talked about informal development. Everyone who talks about African urbanization is talking about informal development equals slums. And I have to, again, uh, defend many of the architects who spoke today. Julia King spoke about uh, bringing back basic services to slum areas in Indian cities. Uh, Joe Noero spoke about providing that most decent unit, which is a structure, a home that sta stays up and that you can add to, of course, um, uh, developing some of Aravena's ideas. We heard that even Assemblage, the British team, effectively working in a slum in the middle of Liverpool. It's a poor area which has been practically abandoned with some very interesting ideas and, uh, and, and uh, et cetera, of how to improve that. So in that sense, I think we should be able to stand back and see a synergy of thinking about you know, the notion of whose city is it, the rights of the city, and how you can deploy spatial tactics to uh, improve, um, I guess, the quality and the rights of people in there. And in that sense, Mark, perhaps we're, too, we're not being obvious enough by saying that by reinforcing the quality of the city, intensifying and improving it, you will actually res reduce the need to eat up external green space. I agree, though, with uh, Enrique that there are some points at which, if you have a tripling of the population, you filled it up, you've got to think of something new. You might as well think of a better one than a, a bad one. So in that sense, I support that approach. Okay. Very shortly, would I to conclude the saying that um, how we can improve uh, the current uh, draft of the urban agenda? Because I still think that we are a bit uh, stuck and we need to think out of the box. And so definitely not speaking in terms of physical model, because I think that we are not able to react sufficiently to new challenges and all the problems that are still there in equality and the new one in terms of limited resources if we can continue to reason in terms of model and, 
and the solution. I think uh, we have been had the same model down there for over 100 years, the same kind of recipe that have been circulating all the education and planning books for, again, more than 150 years, and still our city, they don't look improving. And I think we have limited already too much other realities, other realities to also to display a different way of to be urban, I think, long enough. Thank you. I think I'd, I'd, I'd just like to focus, uh, if, I, if I had the option, uh, focus the agenda entirely on finding ways to do things. How to. Uh, how to should be right on top of the agenda. Um, clearly, all our cities are imperfect. Um, I can't think of any which is heaven. Um, and no government will ever admit failing. But they do. They are willing to take help. And what I'm getting at is that I think we need to move towards what some people call the triple helix, but move towards a better way to manage this overall crisis that we have. Um, clearly, partnerships between industry, government, institutions are at least the most promising. Uh, not a sure shot, but certainly very promising. And what is good, and I think we should count our blessings, is that overall we, we don't disagree about uh, the fact that cities need to be inclusive, productive, uh, run through partnerships, um, that they should safeguard rights and civil liberties. We don't disagree on that. So that's a good thing, and I think we can build on that. Um, but certainly governments need help, and uh, it's really important for the entire ecosystem uh, to, to gather around the governments, because I don't think we can manage without government either. Um, and, and really reinforce the uh, capacity we have to deal with what Mark points out is so real, uh, you know, two degrees rise, uh, we lose the capacity to work. You know, that, that sounds awful. <laughs> so, um, so clearly we do need to work together. Um, and I think if Habitat 3 can achieve a pathway towards collaboration at that level, um, we would have done something. you. Yes, I'd like to agree with uh, Jagan on the need to help governments uh, initially to even articulate, be able to articulate the challenges and then also understand the possible solutions and things that we can do to move along the same path. There's no disagreement about where we all need to go, but how do we all come to one position and then begin moving in the same direction, both as the um, developing countries and then the developed countries, so that we have solutions that can work generally. We may not get it 100% right, but solutions that work for each one of us and taking our governments, taking our social um, political issues, taking out the environmental issues that we're meeting every day as we do our work, because we cannot get away from the climate issues as we develop and seeing how we can do it better together. Yes. Cool. Just to, uh, to close this off, I, I thought this was a very, well, we, 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 have to, we have to close because we're already 15 minutes past our schedule and uh, Joan is, is, is going to close us, uh, close us all. Uh, just a, a final comment, I th thought this was a very rich and very good discussion. I thought the last three questions actually put together uh, uh, the, the problem that we have and part of the solution, the problem of resource constraints that, uh, uh, that will have to be the basis of how we think about uh, our policy formation, the reality that government needs to provide some guidance uh, so that the responsibility can be taken by all of us, and it is by architectural firms and real estate developers and the people who actually uh, benefit from that, and that technology may be part of that solution in, dri in self-driving cars and thinking about how those three elements uh, come together, I think, uh, was, was a nice way to, to end this. Uh, with that, uh, we will stay here. Thanks uh, to all, uh, all uh, for, uh, for your comments. And uh, Joan Close will close us, close us off. Uh, thank you. Thank you.